Okay, let me tell you a little bit about our guest today, Dr. Bob Corrett. He joined the University System of Maryland, its chancellor, back in July of 2015. And he's really done a fantastic job. I mean, he's earned the respect for successful work in several areas, including to ensure college affordability. It's a little bit like an oxymoron, though, Bob. <laughs> I don't know if it is such a thing. But also uh, with his academic es excellence and his efficient use of resources. Prior to that, he was also the chancellor of the University of Massachusetts Systems from 2001, uh, 2011 to 2015, where, again, he really emphasized efficiency, cost savings, initiatives, productive working relationship that he really garnered with not only the uh, government officials in Massachusetts, but with the business leaders in the state. Prior to that, he was president of Towson University from 2003 to 2011, where he also served as a faculty member, dean, executive vice president, and provost during his more than 25-year tenure there. And again, he created partnerships with regional business leaders, nonprofit organizations. He increased student graduation rates and took up a huge capital fundraising campaign and building campaign to support all the infrastructure improvements that they needed there. And here's a, here's a very interesting one. From 1995 to 2003, Bob was also president of San Jose State University. And have you ever been out to San Jose in California? I mean, the weather is tremendous. <laughs> I don't know how they twisted your arm, but I know they did a heavy twist to get you back to Towson, but that's a beautiful, beautiful campus. Uh, Bob serves on many, many, many boards. Too many to mention, but I will name a few. He's on um, the Greater Baltimore Committee, the Baltimore Council on Econ uh, Foreign Affairs, the Economic Alliance of Greater Baltimore, the University of Maryland Medical System, and about literally 12 other boards. He also has been recognized for his contributions to leadership to Maryland and has been recognized by the Daily Record back in 2016 as one of the most influential leaders in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And this is what is really, really fascinating to me. <laughs> Bob has a PhD not in leadership or business management, but in organic chemistry. <laughs> and if you know anybody, remember back in college, you know. Guys on the baseball team, we didn't go through two buildings. We never went to the, or the chemistry building, but we never went to the engineering building. It was so damn hard. They were the courses that knocked you out. But he has a PhD in organic chemistry and a bachelor's degree in chemistry from uh, Suffolk University up in Boston. He's also a hell of a golfer. Watch out for him on a golf course, Jeff, because he'll take your money. He does a hell of a job. Bob, I got to ask, you know, how does a chemistry teacher way back when Make it all the way through the presidencies that you've gone through and the chancellorship and now become chancellor of the University of Maryland. How luck, does that happen? Just, just luck. <laughs> you know, but, you know, I, I always tell students, um, you, you can plan all you want, but you never know where you're going to wind up. And uh, so obviously when I was majoring in chemistry, I, I planned on being a chemist. I didn't want to teach, but I thought I'd be teaching chemistry, maybe become department chair someday. So I was always one of those guys, like even in, you know, when the nuns said, who wants to pass out the chocolate milk, I put up my hand. You know, who wants to run for president of the, of the club, club, I put up my hand. But I never thought beyond that. And um, so I always tell students, just you know, keep bettering yourself, read, learn, get more credentials if you can, and be ready to make decisions when opportunity. So I was actually at Towson uh, and had earned a sabbatical, so I, 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 I decided to uh, stay locally and, and cut a deal with McCormick Spices, who had been trying to hire me as a full-time research chemist, uh, to come up for a, a year on a sabbatical where they would pay half my salary, the university would pay half my salary, which is how a sabbatical works if you go for the full year. Uh, but I, I wanted to have flexibility. I was finishing up my first textbook, and I wanted flexibility to have sort of flex time, because they weren't paying me very much. So they cut that deal, and I started working up there, doing a whole series of really interesting stuff on flavor and fragrance chemistry. But I became like the company mascot because everybody in the company dressed like I am today. And you know, I drove up my motorcycle, big beard, lots of hair, typical <laughs> faculty member. So I'd come in at 10 in the morning, you know, I'd leave at 10 at night. You know, they were all nine to five. They didn't know quite what to do with me. But they did <laughs> offer me a position at the end. And what happened at Towson uh, was that they just hired a new president, a guy named Hoke Smith, who was here for 23 years. And he came from Drake University. And he decided to promote a woman inside to be his vice president of academics. And I had been on the academic senate with her when I was uh, before the sabbatical. So she called me up and said, how'd you like to be dean of sciences for a year? I need an acting dean of sciences. 
And I didn't know exactly what a dean did, but it sounded like a pretty good job. And so instead of going to work for McCormick, I also had a job offer from General Foods uh, and Philip Morris. I decided to go back to Towson, and that's how I got into this. And I was a dean for, um, I've got to remember, uh, eight, uh, I guess uh, six years, and then vice president, provost, and all that for about nine years, executive VP. And then I went to San Jose for nine years, Towson for eight years, UMass for five years, and back again. But it all started you know, with that one opportunity, which I could have said yes or no to, you know, uh, and, uh, and it just, uh, it went and it worked, you know, and uh, so that's how I got here. <laughs> and when they brought you back, when you were at San Jose, I know there was a big problem on campus with the president there, and you were like the savior right. that they came back. Now, well, if, if what did they dangle? What did they dangle to get you back? Well, they actually, you know, they, they had hired, when Hoke left, they had, they had asked me to be in the pool for the search, and I didn't want to leave California. And so they hired this guy, who I won't name, and he came in and did like everything that you learn in President 101 that you're not <laughs> supposed to do, he did, uh, all in a few months. Uh, and they, so he lasted about nine months, and they fired him. Um, and then they came after me uh, because I was a known quantity. The board was somewhat in trouble because of the way they had handled that search. Uh, but I didn't want to leave California. So uh, my, my, six, my predecessor in this job, Britt Kerwin, uh, Britt and I were provosts together. He was at College Park, I was at Towson. We knew each other really well. He kept, every time I was in the area, because higher ed people meet in Washington a lot, I would, you know, he'd try to convince me to come. And finally one day he made me an offer, a little financial package, et cetera. I called my wife, I said, um, the university system of Maryland wants me more than you do. We have to think about this. <laughs> <laughs> and so she agreed, uh, she's an East Coast girl too, so she agreed that we should move uh, back and, uh, and and we did that for the job at Towson. And it was a, a great eight years. Towson is a great campus, and I, I've enjoyed uh, being part of it for you know almost three decades. Oh, you did a, done a fantastic job. And if you ride past York Road, you'll see all kinds of construction going on. Stuff that Bob really started way back when. You also have been in the news a lot lately. You know, <laughs> front page, second page, and so forth with all the issues with University of Maryland and the death of the football player. Uh, can you give people a little bit of update on that? I know with the hiring of the new football coach, I think it looks like you're really going back in a positive direction. Yeah. But how did that all play out? And you know, and it got to the point where the board made a recommendation for the football coach to come back. He came back for a day, and then he was fired by the president. I mean, can you give us a little insight? And uh, wish well, I could. No, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it was a mess. Um, and um, and you know, I think a couple of things happened. Once. Uh, one, one item in terms of the death of Jordan McNair, which is always a tragedy, you know, for the family, for the campus, for the team. Um, that really had nothing to do uh, really directly with the other issue, which was the ESPN article about sort of the inappropriate culture in the program being toxic and being, you know, t too extreme. Um, because the reason, you know, uh, Jordan McNair died was because of the symptoms he was showing, which the trainers misinterpreted as exhaustion and cramping, when it was really heat exhaustion. And by the time they realized it was heat exhaustion, it was almost too late, and, um, and eventually was too late. And, and it really had nothing to do with the toxic culture, which during the study we did there was emanating largely around the strength coach, um, who, uh, and I'm told by football coaches, that strength coaches are generally out of their minds anyway, but uh, this one uh, just used a lot, and this is all public report, you can read this whole report online, uh, just abusive language and demeaning individually, you know, as opposed to like a general kind of like you guys all should, you know, should be doing better. <laughs> uh, he would demean the individual, throw things, and uh, and, uh, but the, the public has joined those two, that because of this alleged toxic culture in this extreme training environment, that's why this young man died, and they don't, really don't have anything to do with each other. So what happened was, and I'll, I'll try to be brief here, the, the, um, we didn't know what the issues were. It was quite probable, and I've said this in front of him, that the president of the university also was culpable, because we didn't know who knew what and who did what. So we decided as a board, the board decided, I work for a board, I'm the CEO of a board, to take over the investigations just to ensure transparency. Now, uh, we were doing that with the campus, so they were involved at every step of the way, but we, we, nothing was filtered to the board. Everything the board got was raw information. Um, and, I, I, and, and, and they were really focused on student athlete welfare, but the, 
and this is me talking now in terms of my perspective, the media pushed them into the personnel side more and more. You know, what's going to happen to the coach? What's going to happen to the AD? What's going to happen to the president? So when they finished their, you know, exhaustive review, um, what they did is make recommendations on how to improve the culture of the program. Uh, uh, and there's a whole series of recommendations that came out of the two studies we had done that are all, and, and part of those studies are also student safety. So what happened to, to, to Jordan McNair will never happen again. Uh, we don't, you know, we hope at least, that, you know, to the extent that we can sure. control those things. Uh, but they also got into making personnel recommendations, which in hindsight, they, they, they will freely admit shouldn't have done in the way they did it. Um, but we also realized, the board, that they can't make decisions on personnel. All they can do is recommend to the president, because the president of the campus is the sole person who has authority to hire and fire on that campus. Wow. And uh, so uh, they, they, they made the recommendations to the president. Uh, and he knew he could either do them or not. Um, and uh, initially agreed to go along with the recommendation, which was to keep the coach in this case as one of the recommendations, but soon realized that wasn't going to be possible. I mean, the campus was erupting. And um, what got missed in a lot of the logic, you know, all of this laborious review of all these details and 200 pages here and on, was the fact that it, basically a young man died and the coach had to go. And the rest didn't matter, <laughs> okay? Uh, no matter how little or how much the coach had to do with it, uh, he was in charge of that program. Um, and so the board has apologized for uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, overstepping. If they had just, in hindsight, made those recommendations privately to the president, this never would have happened. But because it was a public statement, uh, it got into this turmoil you see today uh, where it appears that um, the president either had to uh, 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 implement the recommendations or be fired, and that's not the case. Uh, he had total, total discretion to decide one way or the other, and it had nothing to do with him hang, staying or going. Um, but all of that's gotten lost <laughs> to some extent, so it's a mess. Our job now is to pull it back together. The board chair resigned almost immediately. Um, I, I feel badly for him, but it was the right move in terms of stabilizing this. Exactly. Uh, the, the board, um, freely admitted, as you do it, as you should, and you sh you must do in a crisis, what they had done wrong, uh, and is now moving forward uh, on. So the chairman of the board, the new chairperson, is a woman named Linda Gooden, uh, who is the retired uh, HR vice president uh, from um, Lockheed Martin. Uh, wow. Great credentials, been on the board nine years. Uh, and when she speaks, she just calms you down. She's so stable and unemotive, <laughs> and uh, we've met. You know, we met with the congressional delegation on this. We, we've uh, we've met with the uh, most of the leadership of the House and Senate in Maryland at this point. Uh, conversations with the governor's office. Uh, we're meeting with the Senate at College Park. We're meeting with the trustees from College Park, uh, getting all of this back into the box. Uh, and I think we're on track to get back to running the way we should run. And uh, but um, uh, there's still going to be, you know, some bumps in the road ahead. I'm sure. I think they did a great first step with this new hire of the football coach with Loxley, yep. I guess his name is. Mike Loxley. It seems like he's really, you know, there's cohesiveness now. There's the students, yeah. I mean, they get him a huge ovation yeah. when he was introduced at the, at the basketball. I've game. never seen uh, from every community, you know, uh, we have 500,000 alums just in Maryland, about a million globally from the 12 campuses. Uh, College Park has a huge percentage of those, but we have a lot of people <laughs> interested in what happens. Um, and I've never seen such a positive reception on someone. Uh, I was at the press conference, uh, and he, he handled the questions perfectly. Um, Jordan McNair's father was there to voice support for this new coach. Uh, they've both lost sons. Uh, Loxley lost a son to it, was murdered in Columbia about three years ago. Um, and, um, and of course, John McNair passed away. Uh, that helped begin to heal the wounds a bit. And, one of the things from a personal perspective, and he gave this a call out at the press conference, is I was provost at Towson, he played for Towson, uh, <laughs> and I signed his diploma, uh, and <laughs> I signed his wife's diploma, so he likes me. <laughs> and, uh, but it's good to have him back, and I think he's gonna be great for the program. Yeah. 
you know, it's the, you, hear, you heard about it a little bit in the media, you know, how they compared that to the Lynn Bias, you know, yeah. debacle in the, in the late 80s where Lefty Drizel lost his job. And I mean, there was this tremendous term. Frank was, designated, Frank was on schedule to be the baseball coach at University <laughs> of Maryland right before all that. And, you know, yeah. everything stopped, yeah. you know, and it really hurt, it really hurt oh, yeah. the university for, I mean, years and years Decades, and years. Yeah. This sounds like, you know, we'd be able to make a turn. It looks like you're on pretty even footing right now. Yeah, I, I think so. I think Loxley, uh, one of the, you know, he's the number two guy at Alabama right now, right? So it's not a bad place to be. <laughs> but he's also considered one of the best recruiters in, in, the, in the DMV area here, the, you know, the, uh, the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, we had over 15 high school coaches show up at his press conference, un, uninvited, just showed up. Wow. Um, so I, I think uh, he's going to be able to, you know, we were worried about losing recruiting seasons and stuff, and we may have lost some of it, but I think he's going to be able to pull that back together. Uh, and the, the rest of the programs are moving along solidly. So I, 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 think, I think, as I say, you never know how these things are going to unfold. There are still things out there uh, that uh, could lead in a bad direction. Uh, uh, one is, and this is public knowledge, you know, the, the McNair family, um, you know, uh, could pursue a, a lawsuit uh, for the loss of their son. That will lead to some negative stories again and things. And but that's life. We need to move on and just keep, you know, working in the way we need to work. It's a it's a huge organization to give a plug for the system. We have 12 campuses, 175,000 students. Ten years from now, we'll be 200,000 students. Uh, we're a 5.6 billion dollar budget, 40,000 employees. I say every day something goes wrong someplace on one of the campuses. You know, it's just it's a big, big operation. But the beauty of the system, from a Maryland perspective, is 80% of those students are still from Maryland. Wow. Uh, and 80% of the graduates initially stay here, and roughly 66% never leave. So uh, there's no other institution that has the kind of impact from a workforce or a citizenry perspective uh, that we do. Um, we're graduating 20, 25 or 30,000 kids that stay in Maryland. We graduate about 40,000 a year. And uh, about 30,000 of them just stay here, which is pretty impressive and pretty amazing, actually. So uh, from a business perspective, Bob, you, you know, it is a very complex system, obviously. How do you manage it? I mean, what do you do to keep your finger on the pulse? You know, you got your, all the college presidents report to you. You know, you're trying to make an imp impact. What do you do? How do you manage that from a... From yeah. a Overall perspective. Well, you know, any large, it has to be collaborative. Uh, so the, the best thing I can do is hire the best presidents I can find. We're, we're a very decentralized system. I was here as provost when we created the system. Schaefer took two systems, the five University of Maryland's and the six state universities, and merged them in 88, 89. And I was here as a vice president at the time. So I've been here since the beginning of what we call the new Maryland system. Uh, and we worked hard to make it decentralized. Campus leaders don't like reporting to people like me and having me have a lot of power to say yes or no. They like to run their campuses. And we wanted it that way. And that's, I think, the best way to do it. Because uh, each of these campuses have completely different personalities, <laughs> completely different funding models. I mean, they're like 12 different campuses. Unlike Cal State, where I was, where the 23 might be big or small, they're pretty much financially the same model. UMass, the five campuses, pretty much the same model. I got 12 different models. And uh, so I need 12 presidents that I can trust. Um, and, um, and, 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 and can rely on to, you know, not only run the campus, but let me know and the board know when we should know things, you know, and this is a big part, you know, no surprises, you know, coming up to the corporate headquarters. Uh, and, um, and a lot of collaboration, we, we come together on, you know, a huge part of our budget still comes from the state. Of the 5.6 billion, it's about 1.4 from the state, so it's a huge chunk of money from the state. We don't want to lose that. <laughs> so we, uh, we work on our legislative agenda together. Um, but we give them a lot of flexibility. We'll build a legislative agenda on an operating budget, a capital budget, and some specific you know, bills. And then you know, some legislator from some part of the state will say, you know, I want to put, uh, they just did this last year, I want to put some turf grass on the fields at Towson University. And so you know, what we do is rely on the president of that campus to come and tell us, because we don't want something like that, even though we'd like to get that, we don't want it to interfere with our the primary goals we've already set for the session, but if they, it's an add-on, we'll add on anything you want, right? <laughs> and, uh, but we do that in a collaborative way also. And you'll find every year, you know, six, eight, ten projects that, you know, some member of the legislature gets into the budget uh, one way or the other, and we're very supportive of that. So we support the presidents. I joke, when I was president of San Jose State, which is a 23 campus system in California, about 500,000 students in that system. Wow. And they were hiring the guy that does my job there, 
a guy named Charlie Reed from Florida came in. And they came to see me, the, the headhunters came to see me, the search firm came to see me and said, what do you want in your new chancellor? And I said, I want somebody who goes to Sacramento, to the state capitol, gets a big bag of money, <laughs> comes to San Jose, puts it on my desk and leaves. That's what I want. <laughs> So I understand you know, the job of a system head. I mean, a huge part of my job is to bring in a significant operating budget, to bring in, we do about you know, 300 to 400 million a year in capital construction on the state side of our budget. Wow. So to bring in that, so if you take those two together, you're talking about $2 billion. So if I can bring in that $2 billion every year, the campuses are pretty happy, because <laughs> that's, that's what they need to do what they do. And then beyond that, a lot of it is public policy and, uh, and political support. So I do a lot of this, telling and selling. Uh, across the state, um, so that I'm out, uh, you know, explaining. I've always felt that Doug alluded to this. Going back to when I was a dean, at, I was dean of sciences at Towson. Is the I need the business community behind me and my institutions, uh, because if I go to uh, Sacramento or I go to Annapolis or I go to Boston, and I go to the legislature and say I need A, B, C, D, I'm one of many, many agencies asking for money. But if the business community says, you know, we need the workforce, we need the cyber professionals that, you know, university systems, but we need the nurses, we need the teachers, then I get a lot of political clout out of that by having the business community behind me. And that has worked, uh, you know, and one of the first things I did as dean, and that's 1981, a long time ago, was create a, sci a science advisory board of people from Beckton Dickinson, in those days wow. Westinghouse, Bendix, Noxell, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and those, those people went and fought the battles with us uh, in Annapolis, you know. It really segues into you. You know, you personally had a strong economic focus, you know, all throughout your career. Mm -hmm. You know, what is USM doing on that front? How yeah, you... one of the reasons I got the job um, is that um, the search committee and a guy named Norm Augustine, who was the CEO of Lockheed for many years and internationally known, in particular, they wanted somebody who could push the economic development agenda. You know, as I said, we're a 12 campus system. We do about. Um, yeah, what, roughly 1.4 billion in federal research uh, every year, and that grows about 1% a year. Uh, but we didn't have, we weren't, we weren't really creating new companies in any significant, we weren't creating IP and commercializing it in any significant level. Uh, so about, um, I would say while I was president at Towson, the board started getting into this, and they created an economic development committee. Um, and uh, I don't know if it was the first chair, but one of the chairs I worked with the most was Mike Gill, who's now the Secretary of Commerce and a Towson alum, by the way. <laughs> uh, and, um, and now Gary Atman from the Atman family, um, who runs FutureCare, is the head of that group. Uh, and they began to really push. Mike did, Gary did. So I came back into that environment. I hired a vice chancellor for economic development, first time we ever had one at the system level. And at the system level, we're a pretty small operation. We have about 110 people. Uh, but 100 of them you never see. They're the people that do all the financials, the audits, everything behind the scenes. But the 10 or 20 that you know, are out there collaborating with the campuses. You know, we can't create the companies. You know, we, we can't create the workforce. We need to get the campuses to do that. So I have, you know, an academic vice chancellor, an administrative vice chancellor, I had an audit person, et cetera, and they all work with their counterparts on the campus levels. And we began to drive the agenda. So I hired Tom Sadowski, who some of you may know. Uh, he was the head of the Economic Alliance of Greater Baltimore for about eight or nine years. Before that, I knew him as the number two guy in economic development in Baltimore County. And before that, he was in Harford County, where I first met him many, many years ago. And Tom's got a huge amount of energy. He's got a two-person team, and he's driving the agenda. Wow. But he's working with all the people on the campuses, the research vice presidents, the economic development outreach people, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we have created, over the last 25 or 30 years, we have three research parks at the Baltimore here, at the, on the, on the uh, uh, west side of Martin Luther King, uh, UMBC, the BW Tech Park at UMBC, um, and uh, the Discovery uh, Zone down at College Park. And then we have seven incubators. Wow. So we have uh, over um, 400 companies in those 10 facilities uh, with almost 10,000 employees. Uh, and as a result of that, we've also put money into our own venture funds. So we, we have a a uh, uh, $25 million venture fund that we are now, we just invested in four companies over the past two years. Uh, we bring in co-investors with us, in anybody who's interested, individuals, Able Foundation, whatever. Wow. Um, and um, and uh, we have a number, of the campuses have some venture funds, so UM Ventures out of the Baltimore campus in, uh, invested in Harpoon Medical, which you may have read about. The mistral valve can be replaced with almost like day surgery today. Instead of open heart surgery, they can use this device. 
uh, and replace it. Um, the company sold for $175 million recently. Uh, and if it f passes all clinical trials right now that are going on in Poland, uh, it will generate another $75 million. Wow. And UMB was a small investor uh, in that company. So we're investing in our own companies. We are now generating about 100 new companies, 500 inventions a year uh, as a system, mostly out of Baltimore and uh, College Park, but uh, the others are all playing. Uh, we're creating about 100 companies a year uh, and about 50 patents a year. Uh, and you're beginning to see licensing revenues go up, and we're taking equity in a lot of these companies. So in the long run, we hope that's where the big payoffs will be when like the harpoons get sold, that we participate uh, in that. In that. Uh, we've also gotten the state to put initially uh, $50 million that we had in reserve funds, allow us to put that into a quasi-endowment for investment. And the investment income off of that endowment can now be used to fund companies. Uh, and uh, we did that uh, with the state, and they, they've done the same thing with the pension fund, where they put 50 million in the pension fund, and now they're gonna put 75 million more over the next two years, another uh, 150 million uh, that's gonna be used through the in pension fund to invest in startup companies. So there's a lot more venture money that we're helping to generate um, to help these companies, particularly early stage, um, uh, you know, uh, before even Series A, uh, in, 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 uh, and it's really helping to pay off with a number of other programs that already exist. Uh, so I, on this Economic Development Committee of the Board, every meeting, we had one this week, we have a new startup company come in, and I gotta tell you, you want to invest in every one of these. Some of these <laughs> things are just you know, beyond belief what, 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 is, um, um, you know, what is coming out of our, our uh, and it all goes away from high tech to the one that was most recently funded. We just invested, I think, uh, 500,000 in Zest Tea which is a new tea drink that's already had a lot of success regionally and nationally uh, that has the same amount of caffeine as a cup of coffee as opposed to most teas which are much, much lower and made with organic materials. Um, so it's not just high tech, it's the whole spectrum of, uh, of investments. So if any of you are interested in being co-investors, I can put you in touch with the right people. <laughs> we got some investors here. But, but with all let, me, let me end, but the, the biggest thing we do in economic development is workforce. So, you know, I generate 40,000 graduates, 30,000 stay here, but the state said we need more cyber people. We, we've ratcheted up cyber graduates by about 100%. We're graduating about 3,500 cyber warriors a year now, uh, and that's going to keep growing. So we can really target our workforce as it relates to oh, economic development. He said it's a huge need that they can't fill. But with all this money, and it sounds like a lot of good things are happening from the financial perspective, you, you told me that you're taking a stronger focus in Baltimore City especially. Yeah. What are you guys doing there? I mean, can we ever fix Baltimore City? I mean, that's, yeah. that's a question we've been asking for decades and decades and decades. Yeah, I mean, I had a dinner at my house last night. I had uh, 22 people at the house for dinner. Um, I didn't cook. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, I had the foundations there. I had Franz Merrick Foundation there. I had B Baltimore Community Foundation, Able Foundation, among others. I had a, a number of the CEOs, uh, M&T Bank, you know, you know, was there. and. Uh, uh, some of the nonprofits like Greater Baltimore Committee, EAGB, talking about this issue. Jim Smith was there representing the mayor, Catherine couldn't come, but we had a three hour conversation on Baltimore City. And that was just one small part of what we've been doing with Baltimore City. But if you look at what my campuses are doing, you know, Baltimore has reached out to the west side. I mean, yet the Baltimore campus is, is, is all, almost all graduate. It's all master's, doctorate, MD, <laughs> PhD. Very small, almost no undergraduates. That kind of campus normally doesn't get involved in day-to-day -day life around itself, you know. Those schools over there, there are seven schools within the college at, at University of Maryland, Baltimore, dentistry, medicine, pharmacy, social work, et cetera, nursing, that are reaching out to the west side here with uh, community development centers, helping the families over there, figuring out how to get health insurance, how to get dental coverage, uh, how to get uh, a loan, uh, you know, how to go to school, whatever they need, right? They have a farmer's market they run every week. They, it's gotten so popular, they just got a building donated to them by one of the churches so they can triple the size of their community development center. Wow. This is you know, just a sideline for really what they do day to day, but it's, it's hugely important to that part of the city. Hopkins is doing similar things on the east side, you know, around, around the hospital. Um, and then you have the campuses, you know, uh, Towson has over 200 engagements in the city. Uh, you know, some of them are small with one school, some of them are neighborhood-wide. You've got uh, UMBC uh, all over the city with Sherman scholars and interns from the Peace Corps, 
uh, working with Lakeland Elementary School, getting them to be among the, you know, uh, pass all of the appropriate level exams where that school, nobody was passing the exams, uh, in, uh, the NAEP exams before. So uh, when I came back, I said, I'm a, I, and even though I grew up in the woods of Maine, <laughs> a blue collar boy from Maine, I, I really have become a big city a person. I like San Jose, I like Boston, I like Baltimore. And we can't be the kind of state we want to be and have the kind of city we have. You can't have a city with the kind of crime we have. That's right. You can't have a city with these low educational output. And it's all socioeconomic. In this city, it, hap it happens to have a strong racial connotation, too, because we have such a, a large African-American population. But it's really socioeconomic. And if we don't fix it, the whole thing's going to collapse eventually. Uh, and you know, we can build the, you know, the Inner Harbor and the East Harbor and the Cantons and stuff, but eventually it's going to collapse. Uh, you cannot have two worlds living side by side. So I, I, I said to myself, you know, what can we do? And the two things that I came up with as a system were you know, teachers trained particularly to work in the urban environment, all right? which is a difficult, challenging environment. Absolutely. Uh, you have to be you know, half psychologist, half social worker, you know, as well as a teacher. You, you, you're dealing with young, young people who have a lot of challenges in life. And you have to be able to deal with them uh, if they're going to learn anything. And then the, uh, the other was to open up the pipeline of these young people uh, so that they stay in high school and eventually go someplace and, and not drop out. You know? And right now, uh, we have the dropout rate uh, in the high schools in the cities uh, about 20% higher than the state average. Uh, so these kids see no hope and they just drop out. And then they just become you know, either a problem you know, in terms of welfare, or they get into the drug trade and they become a problem in terms of safety. And uh, so we've got to get these young people educated. And so I've got this huge initiative called B-Power, which was dealing with about 100 kids when I started. We now have it up to 1,200. Wow. Um, and this is just one piece. But it, it's, it's, all it is is a, a program that's aimed at taking these young people into summer programs that get them ready to either go college or career. And if they're ready to go to college, puts them into dual enrollment programs where they take courses that count both the high school credit and college credit, and then pass those courses and eventually come into us, either through a community college like CCBC or BCCC. Uh, and so it's a huge, I think it's a huge part. Now it's interesting, last night I had these 22 people, and uh, we talked about education quite a bit. The, the, I would say 70% of the discussion last night was on safety in, in Baltimore. And it's, it's gone from you know, safety in the areas where drugs were being sold and you know, drug dealer, fighting drug dealer, where we could all to somewhat stay insular from it because it wasn't impacting us. It's all over the streets now. And, and it's beginning to affect the huge, I'm on the GBC board, I can tell you this comes up all the time. The, the, our companies are gonna walk out of this city instead of coming into this city That's right. if we don't change this. So it, it, it's, a, it's something, um, and I don't care by the way, if these young people, if none of them come to my system, I don't care. I just, I just want them to go you know, someplace. Where, and I've met with Morgan, we're pulling Morgan into this. If they want to go to Morgan, that's fine. If they want to go in the military, that's fine. If they want to go into apprenticeship programs, we'll show them how to get into the different apprenticeship programs where you can make a fortune. You know, we have a cybersecurity uh, uh, apprenticeship program run out of UMBC that's not a college, it's a, a, a traditional apprenticeship program. You can earn 70, 80,000 a year once you graduate from that apprenticeship program. You know? So we're trying to get them into these, into these tracks and I hope we can you know, have an impact. Well, you know, it just was national news a week or two ago about the lady that got stabbed. Ah, you know, I mean, national news. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about Baltimore, the murder, cap murder yeah. capital of the, of the, war of the uh, country, and then this lady's giving some money. How many people give money to people when they're at the red light? Yeah, I don't I give it to charities who give it to them. <laughs> it's just like, you I know, just, I mean, <laughs> it, you almost got to be, you know, you don't want to roll the window down now. Yeah. You know, you roll it down a little bit, you hand the dollar out. I mean, that's what's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the stigma we, gotta, we have to erase. Yeah. And you know, you, what you've got to do, you, you can't just take you know, the homeless and sort of put the, hide them. You've got to come up with programs where they're no longer going to be homeless. I mean, the kind of thing you were talking about today coming out of prison. That's another year. I'm on the Kerwin Commission, too, which is looking at the funding formula for K through 12 for the next decade or more. We're not looking just at that. We're looking at college and career readiness. We're looking at uh, what we call career and technical education. When I was in high school, it was called VOTEC. But opening up these other pathways, to some extent, that have been closed for a long time, 
Um, you know, people felt if they didn't go to college, they weren't successful. Right. There's a lot of jobs you can get without going to college that are really good jobs. And, and so, you know, how do we get you to know that, to see that? You know, one of the simple ideas they did in Chicago, which I like, is every high school kid before they graduate has to have a plan on what they're going to do next. Now, obviously, they can change that, but at least they know what the next step is and then figure out from there as opposed to, I don't know, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. And uh, <laughs> so it's... Well, you uh, can find yourself. You go to Europe and you can... <laughs> yeah. Now, you talk about changes, Bob, you know, and higher education is definitely changing. You know, what's going on? What, what changes are you seeing at USM? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the, the biggest change for us uh, and, and one of the biggest dangers, and it, 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 it affects all of you and your kids and grandkids, is state support, uh, even in a state like Maryland, which is probably one of the most proactive education states in the country, and from a higher ed perspective, even better than Massachusetts. Massachusetts puts a lot of money into K-12. They're a little stingy on the higher ed side. Um, but, you know, when I was in school, it's a long, long time ago, but the state at a public university, the state paid 70% of the cost, and the student paid 30% of the cost, maybe 20% of the cost, and your, t your 20 or 30% could be subsidized by the federal government. Not a lot in those days, but there was still, you know, federal loans had just come in. And today, even in, 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 in nationally, state support is down in the 20 to 30 percent range across the nation, instead of 70 to 80 percent range. Wow. And so the student is paying a lot more. Of, and, and so it really is, the cost, if you adjust for inflation, hasn't gone up that much in the last 30 or 40 years. What, what's gone up is the proportion paid by the student. Uh, and that's real. It's impacting them. Uh, significantly, so half, a, 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 it varies by school, but at Towson, which I know the best, 50% uh, of the graduates have no debt, but 50% have almost 30,000 a year in debt when they, if you go to the pharmacy school, the average debt is about $200,000 when you get out. That's crazy, you know, uh, uh, and, and uh, so we have to figure out a way to try to get that cost back down, which means the federal government and the state government has to continue to subsidize it. We'll do our best to keep our costs down. We've been working on efficiency and effective initiatives for over 12 years. We can, in an auditable way, show you we're saving the state 40 to 60 million a year that neither the state nor the student has to pay because of efficiencies in technology, et cetera. And we'll continue to do that. And we're looking at new ways to teach where we can teach and, and produce graduates a lot less costly. So that's a big challenge for us. The other big challenge, there are two. Uh, one is um, the student demographics, uh, the changing population. Um, uh, a, lot of, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of new students who are st uh, first generation um, and don't have families and background that ca help guide them at all. Uh, that's going to be a shift. Uh, and the third is the competitors and the technology that comes with it. Um, you know, we have things like University of Phoenix, these four, Strayer, et cetera, for-profit institutions, you know, traded on the New York Stock Exchange, competing with us. We have non-profits like Southern New Hampshire University. Now, I grew up, you know, 80 miles from where Southern New Hampshire University's anchor institution is. I had never heard of it, you know. I mean, 30 years ago, there was no such. They bought a small campus that was accredited, changed the name, went online, and they have 37,000 students taking courses from them every day today. Uh, Arizona State Online is now, Gov Western Governors University has been around for decades. You never heard about them in Maryland. They're advertising all over Maryland. UMUC, my online arm, where we have 140 programs through the doctorate, fully online, 70,000 students every day taking those wow. courses across the globe. Uh, we are going to be spending a lot of money on advertising to spread that footprint to compete with all these other competitors. Because UMUC, I, if I have 175,000 students, you know, a third of them or more are coming from UMUC. It's a huge part of what we do. So it's a really interesting world, I should say, <laughs> in terms of the one I started in. And, uh, but I think we're in the right, uh, going in the right direction. What I, I've given a lot of talks on the workforce of the future, and I always end it with, every institution needs to decide its mission, its role, how it's going to do it, and what population it attracts. So if you go to a St. John's College in Annapolis, you're going to have a very different experience than if you go to, let's say, College Park. You know? And so students, some students will want the kind of experience that's at St. John's. Some will want the experience that's College Park, or everything in between and around that. And then every student needs to decide which one works best for them. And so I, I, I don't care if some of us get bigger or smaller, or some of us even go out of business, as long as all those pathways are available. I, I do think you know, the traditional pathway 
even though it's changing in a lot of ways, is not going away. Most of the people in this room don't want their kid to earn a bachelor's degree or their grandson by giving them a laptop and sending them to the bedroom. They want them to go to a campus and grow up. <laughs> so residential campuses are not going away. Traditional uh, college is not going away. How we produce that education is changing dramatically. And, uh, and that's actually a lot of fun, I think. Uh, we're learning a lot more about how people learn, how to be better teach them, uh, and get many more of them through the pipeline more quickly uh, and less expensively. Uh, the other truism, when I went to school, and I said first, first generation, blue collar boy from Maine, didn't know what the heck I was doing. It was the 60s, and there was a lot to do beyond studying. All right? <laughs> and I, I still worked myself through full time in the summers, part time fall and spring, graduated in four years with no debt. Kids today can't do that. I don't care if they work 25 hours a week during the school year right. and work full time in the summer, they're going to largely, if, if the parents aren't helping them, graduate with debt. And, and that's just not right for the future of our society. We've got to figure out a way to turn that around. Well, you talk about some of the changes in the system, and you talk about advertising. I mean, I, I heard some advertising about UM, uh, the UM, online. Yeah, uh, UMUC. MBA program, no GREs required. Right. How do they do that? I mean, how, you know, is it, is it, you know, how do they screen? How do, you know, if there's no GREs, you know, what, what's the population? And, and do a lot of people drop out? I mean, how does that work? No, I think, I think UMUC is one of our more creative arms. One of the reasons they're one of our more creative arms, they're, they're one in one of the more competitive environments, and they also are, are probably the most profitable of my campuses. They throw up a significant margin every year, so they have a lot of money to invest in, in looking at things and changing things. They do, a, uh, uh, they, they do, they do, they do their own placement exams. Uh, they do have uh, uh, competency-based uh, exams. Um, and so they will make sure that you, know, you are put into the right track at the right level uh, when you enter. One of the things we're doing, there's a partnership out of Harvard and MIT called edX. You may have read about it. edX is another platform, educational platform, run by Harvard and MIT. It's actually run out of MIT. And um, they, are, they started off with 40 million investment, 20 from each campus, to provide free massive online courses online globally. Wow. Now, a massive online course, free you understand, nobody pays for it. Online you understand. Massive means you can have 200,000 students taking that class, okay? So the idea was that they would offer these MOOCs, massive online courses, internationally, largely for people that couldn't get an education any other way. So they began doing that. So when I was president of the UMass system, the CEO came to see me, and he said, he's a very bright, engineer from MIT, and he says, you know, they gave me $40 million to offer these courses internationally for free, and I'm doing that, it's going great. He says, but you know, there's no revenue. <laughs> he says, eventually the $40 million is gonna be gone. <laughs> so I need to figure out how to do what I'm doing, but generate some money. So he started off by uh, offering, uh, most of the people that take these massive online courses come in and go out of them. So you might have a 3% finish it, okay? Which doesn't matter, because it's all free. But for the 3% that finish it, if they give us 100 bucks, we'll give them an exam. If they pass the exam, we'll give them three credits. So they just got three college credits for $100, okay? So that was one way to generate money. If you need tutoring for a small fee, we'll give you a tutor, online tutor, to help you. So there are a whole series of things. The newest model is we're offering micro-masters, you'll love these terms, micro-masters degrees, micro-bachelor's degrees, and nano-certificates, right? <laughs> so what the idea, all three work the same way. Let me talk about the master's degree. Let's say a master's degree takes 30 credits, right? You can take up to nine credits of your master's degree through a MOOC on edX. So that's nine credits for free, basically. You take an exam, 100 bucks each, $300, you've got nine credits. Once you've taken that, we'll accept all of those nine credits into our traditional master's program, so for 21 more credits, you get a master's degree. We're doing this with the bachelor's degree. It's a way to accelerate and keep the cost down. Um, and so there's a whole series of these kind of things happening uh, in a changing world. Now, to join edX, uh, the university joined edX, cost us two million bucks to be a member of edX. Now, if you play this out right, you can get that money back. They sent us a nice royalty check last year for all the courses we're offering. Al almost all my campuses are now involved in offering courses through the edX platform beyond what we do with UMUC and online courses that are campus-based. I mean, there's a whole series of these things. So it's a very complex, uh, uh, competitive environment. Um, but we, we, we got, you know, I've got some of the most, I've got what, six, 7,000 faculty. They're pretty creative, <laughs> you know, and uh, they're, they're, they're doing well. What you find with UMUC, though, it's kind of interesting. Uh, 
Purdue University just bought Kaplan. So now you have Purdue Kaplan Global University, which is basically their UMUC competing with us. They're advertising here too. I like their ads, by the way. They're doing a really good job. And uh, so that whole uh, world of you know, lifelong learning uh, is going in all kinds of directions. Um, and um, you know, it's a lot of fun, but it's, it's challenging to, uh, to, keep up, to keep up with it. Definitely some exciting things going on. I'm gonna open it up for questions right now from the audience. Lee Warner. I just, uh, not trying to blow smoke up your skirt, but obviously you checked the intellectual IQ box, PhD in organic chem, and you've had unbelievable experiences that you've just described to us. I guess my question is, you have a certain leadership style. Some are hard nosed, the woman who speaks softly and calms everybody down. Did your style develop naturally and almost when you go, I don't know, just to me? Or were you influenced by a few situations or maybe yeah. people and your style has changed over the years? Can you rephrase that for the, for the camera, Bob? Yeah, and he's, he's asking how my leadership style developed. Um, you know, some people are top down, some people are servant leaders, bottom up. And, you know, I think it, it's partly coming out of the academic culture. Uh, you know, we use the term shared governance. Uh, I use the analogy that when, you know, the first university in this country was Harvard, you know, over 400 years ago. And the way it started, I wasn't there, but I'm guessing, <laughs> was there were probably seven uh, white guys uh, that were the faculty, and they taught courses. And every day they had lunch and dinner together, you know. And then one day one of them said, you know, we got this paperwork we have to fill out for the state. So if you fill out the paperwork, you can teach one less course and you can be the president, all right? But we're still going to have lunch and dinner together. And that's how shared governance started. Uh, so that the faculty, even though they're not management, uh, and the staff and the students have a role in really providing advice and guidance to those that are charged with running the place, okay? And that gets touchy, because sometimes the students say, I wor you work for me. I go, well, sort of. <laughs> you know, not quite exactly like that, but you know, I am here to provide you a service. Um, but uh, the academic world sort of has this collaborative environment. And then Towson was a very strong shared governance campus, and I spent my first 21 years there. So I came out of that. Now I went to California, which is a unionized environment. We can't, wow. by law, have unionized faculty in Maryland. Glendening allowed for unionized staff on the campuses, but up until Glendening, we couldn't have unionized staff. But we still can't have unionized faculty. So I walked into a unionized environment, both in Massachusetts and California, very different. Uh, but my style still worked there um, because they trusted me. Uh, and uh, I used to actually, when the unions would protest in the, at Cal State, they would, I had, was in this tower that was built in the 800 years ago, and I had a quad, and uh, there'd be 300 people marching around my tower. I'd go out and cup of coffee and march with them. I'd say, why are we marching today? <laughs> you know, would, and sort of disarm them a bit, you know, and, and get back to a normal, let's talk this out kind of thing. So I've always been, you know, I, I, I am, I, what I do view myself, though, is I, I am tenacious. Um, I will, uh, I say to my direct reports, I have eight, uh, direct reports uh, at the senior level, at the corporate level, uh, that if I may not ask you about something for a while, but I'll never forget. You can be sure I'll come back and ask you at some point. So don't, don't forget what I asked you to do. And so I, 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 uh, I really do rely on everybody to do their job, uh, but I do hold them accountable, and I do track it. <laughs> I'm, I'm tenacious on making sure we move things forward. Yeah. You know, uh, Ken Wexley and I wrote an article uh, probably about five years ago, and it's published. And the article was on um, 10, outs 10 traits of outstanding leaders. And we actually, that article, we yeah. actually mentioned Bob, yeah. uh, Bob Corrette. And two of the traits, and I'm going to it all, but two of the traits that we felt were, were really critical. One was confident. You've got to have confidence in all what you do. I mean, he has a tremendous amount of confidence. And number two was humility. Mm. You would never know if you met Bob Corrette that he holds a position that he holds. I mean, you know, and he's on first name basis with, you know, top leaders, not only in the state of Maryland, but, you know, throughout the country. I mean, that degree of humility, you know, maybe that came up from your being in New Hampshire and growing up in the environment, mm -hmm. but he's got it. And, you know, he, that's why he, I think he's one of the tremendous and, and Let me just add one thing to this. You know, I was a campus head twice for 18 years, and now I've been a system head twice for nine years. And the beauty of that is all the campus heads respect the fact that I've been in their shoes. And the other thing I really do believe about systems, and I wouldn't say that every system head believes this, but the way to build a great system is to build great campuses. Nobody really has to know about the system. 
what people need to know is that if you go to one of our campuses, you're going to get a great education, you know, and that you're having a great experience. And so I, the, 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 obviously the campus presidents like that approach, you know, and so I, that's really my job is to help them become better and better and better at what, the, what, they, what they do. Really, it's a concept of servant yeah. leadership, too. Dave. Yeah. Right. Those roles were later. You weren't good enough to go. You know, yeah, right. Right. Or, or right. not even just good enough, just you know, yeah. have a passion for something other right. than right. Right. school. But I think, I think maybe a 21st century version of that, yeah. you know, that is more about game, gamification and yeah. robotics that would teach grade schoolers yeah. that get them interested in technical things or whatever that aren't necessarily college. I think is, uh, is mm. great. But my question was really more. I want to go back to the um, to the uh, to the board, you know, region uh, question. And really, the question is not about that. It seems to me that you know, we sort of have a little bit of a problem, whether it's in nonprofit world or whether it's board of regents or whether it's corporate boards of, you know, people take board positions. And as long as everything's fine and the company's moving or the nonprofit's moving, you know, it's a great resume builder or it's a great political appointment or it's a great, you know, uh, whatever, maybe a little, little stipend. And then something goes wrong. And it seems to me a lot of these board members that for the board positions really are ill-prepared mm. to face the crises mm. that they're facing. And at the end of the day, I mean, you know, had there been, and I'm not yeah. in this yeah, yeah. situation, but, but, you know, there's training or awareness, yeah. this readiness for dealing with, you know, it's great when all the enemy's rosy and you just smile. Yeah, and right. no one knows right, right. Nobody even knew who the boards or regions were right, right. for you until they were all on the right. front page of the sun. Right. Um, it seems to me that people need it. You know, I don't know what the question there is. You know, yeah. It seems that people need to kind of think about yeah. it's more than just a resume builder when you're when you're accepting these kind of roles that can be right. you know it can be fairly significant yeah. something wrong. Well, and what happens? And this is true in every state. Actually, I can give you. You know, there's a group called the Association of Governing Boards that does a lot of work in this arena, and I'm on their president's advisory group. And uh, public boards, in particular, private boards tend to be focused on fundraising. You know, uh, public boards are. Political, either political appointees, as in our state, and this is the ones I've been in have all been this way, where the governor appoints virtually everybody, or they're on by statute. For example, the Secretary of Agriculture is on by statute, going back to the ag days. Um, some states, they're elected by the public, which is, uh, in my opinion, a worse model, <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> if, you want to, if you want something that's cohesive, at least. But what we have to do is work with governors, and we try to do this, that these are not just positions that you give to someone because they were a big donor, or a, but it's someone who has a, a passion for the, for the product, i.e. higher education, uh, and hopefully a background you know, that can help in some way, you know, whether it's a financial or an audit or a, you know, a academic. Um, and I, you know, I think uh, uh, the governor has been uh, pretty good with us in terms of giving us some really solid people. Then orientation is important. We put them through a very solid orientation, but we're going to use more and more with the Association of Government, put them into corporate training. Uh, and, uh, but luckily, many of the ones, particularly the leadership, the ones that are chairing the major committees and who give mo the most of their time, they've been around the block. And you know, they, can, they can handle a lot of this. Uh, some of the others, it's really hard emotionally when the whole world is coming down on you. And, and actually, in my case, they're getting no stipends. You know, so they're putting in huge amounts of hours and lots of hard work and getting beat up you know, for trying to do good stuff. You know. yeah. Ken. Nope, oh, sorry. <laughs> Bob, do you believe that the university has a responsibility to help its citizens to become smart voters? Mm -hmm. By that I mean maybe have cognitive skills like critical thinking. Mm -hmm. So my question is two parts. Do you think that is a responsibility <laughs> Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm a real believer. I wrote back in the 80s an op-ed on this. One of the strengths of the American system, and it worked for me. You know, I was a nerd. I wanted to take chemistry and math. I didn't want sociology, philosophy. I didn't want history. I didn't want any of those things. <laughs> I had to take those things to graduate, right? Whether you call it the arts and science core or the gen ed core, you know, 
we all, if we got a bachelor's degree, had some form of that. Um, and really, it's those skills. I mean, it's the communication skills, the, the, the uh, uh, critical thinking skills, uh, in some cases, the team building skills that give you the kind of you know, skills you need to do the kind of jobs a lot of us do today. You know, I, I say I'm still a chemist, and when they interview me, they say, I'm an organic chemist. They say, do you still do chemistry? I, sell, I, I can make a great martini, <laughs> and I can make a great souffle. It's the same skill set, just different chem just chemicals are different. You know, so, but, uh, so you know, the, what, what we like to say, we want to create T-shaped individuals. You know, people that in the, in the, in the vertical part of the T have the skills, whether it's chemistry, computer science, communications, whatever it is, to do their job, social workers, nurses, but then the cross becomes the broad base. All of the, what we consider the traditional skills of an educated person. And you know, I think people, uh, as we go on in life, begin to recognize how important those are. Within that broad set, in America in particular, we need to re-engage the, 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 the students to understand their role in society. Uh, I always, I give speeches on the, you know, the we versus the me. You know, it's not all about what you're going to do, it's also what impact you're going to have on everyone else uh, in the society you're in. Uh, so again, with board leadership, we've launched an effort two years ago uh, that is looking at simple things, simpler things like getting the students out to vote themselves, uh, as, uh, so a voter you know, initiative that the campuses are driving. Uh, there's a, uh, a couple of curricular initiatives that are looking at how to thematically build in the idea of, I've given a couple of national speeches on what you would call uh, civic education, civic engagement, and civic responsibility. Uh, and by uh, civic education, you can all sort of guess what that is. It's not just, you know, who's on the Supreme Court and you know, how does a bill become law, but it's really, what's your role in society? How does a democracy work? Uh, and then, you know, once you've got that, be guilt to do that on the campus by having the students actually engaged on the campus. You know, be in clubs, be in student government, be involved in cleanups, do the kinds of things you do in a community so that when they come out, they become civ you know, civically uh, uh, responsible citizens. So that's become, again, um, you know, things erode. I like to say as a chemist, you know, the word entropy, you know, that word means that the world is going to disorder. It is. As soon as you have something fixed, as you walk out that door, it begins to disorder again. And, and so these kind of things come up and down because you know, you know, we had a pretty strong approach to that years ago and it sort of disappeared, you know, and now we're building it back in to that um, you know, general education outcome that we expect of our students. And you know, I think also getting students in the right track, you know, a lot of young people, they're not going to college. You know, when, when higher education was created, it was created uh, each step of the way to help society do something. So the original signers of the Declaration of Independence with the Harvards, the Yales, the Dartmouths, the Princetons, the Rutgers, the original 13 colonies, they were looking at creating leaders to keep the country going. Not the you know, man and woman in the street. It was largely the clergy and the aristocracy that went to college. And they took a traditional, you know, the kind of education you would have gotten in the 12th century. <laughs> you know, theology, you know, philosophy. But they became broad-based educated people. Uh, and then we got to the, you know, the GI Bill and we got to the, um, uh, the land grant movement and we began to focus on the work that was needed for the new mechanical society, you know, engineers and mechanically trained people and, and the whole idea of professional education grew. But we don't want to lose. Kids aren't coming. I didn't go because I just wanted to become a broad-based educated individual. It's a nice thing, but that wasn't what I was thinking about. <laughs> I was thinking about getting a job. Uh, and so how do you take that young person that's coming in who is in a track to become employable, and f to the extent that they want and it is desirable, give them the broader education so that they can continue to grow uh, and not be, you know, pigeonholed because, you know, they can they can repair, you know, a, you know, 1955 Mustang, but they can't do a 1995 one, you know, because they have never grown beyond that point, you know. And so, how do you continue lifelong? And in this world, if, there are a whole bunch of books. Uh, uh, one called uh, Robot Proof kind of education you need when the robots and artificial intelligence take over and there are very few jobs. Uh, there's another one called Rise of the Robots. Um, there are a whole bunch of these. One of the guys that ran for governor wrote one called Industries of the Future. They all say the same thing to some extent. Artificial intelligence, hardware, software, robotics are going to take most of the jobs. But they're not going to take them all. And you're going to still need people to build the robots, clean the robots, maintain the robots. 
but what kind of education did you, do you need? And a big part of that education is still what I'm talking about, is that broad-based, long, lifetime learning where you're continuing to grow all the time. The chemistry I learned in graduate school is prehistoric. <laughs> you know, the DNA molecule had not been sequenced yet when I was in graduate school, and I'm living in a high-rise in Boston where if a dog pooped, they would take it and send it for a DNA sample, find out which apartment was in it, and build them, you know, find them. When you can do DNA sampling, you know, at that price range, you know, given what I was in 1974 where you couldn't even do it, uh, you can see how technology has transformed us, and, uh, and it's going to continue to do so. Uh, but we need to have educated people ready for that new world also. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I remember when I was in graduate school, and then we have one more question, uh, Bob. Uh, there was a dichotomy between education and vocationally yeah. getting a job. And the philosophy of the graduate school, and professor in particular, yeah. we're here to educate right, you. Right. We're right. not here to get you a job. Right, right. Who's got the final question? Steve. Yeah, No, I, I can assure you, my board, my presidents, and I all agree with you. The, the students today are different than the ones I grew up with as a student. Um, as uneducated as I was when I went to college, I did realize that I was there to listen to all kinds of points of view. I mean, that was part of the reason to be there, right? It was Boston, it was the 60s, I was listening to all kinds of points of view. <laughs> uh, a lot of the kids, not all of them, but a lot of the kids today don't want the other side of it. You'll say to them, don't you think you should be able to listen to and get something? No, I don't want to be exposed to it. I'm not interested. And so our job is to explain to them they should be interested because there are other points of view. Um, and, uh, and my board has come down strong on that. We work very hard nationally on that. With the, uh, I just step, stepped down as the president of APLU, which is the organization that represents the college parks of the world, the land-grant universities. We've come out with strong statements, and, and, and the campuses are working hard uh, there is no reason, other than safety in some cases, but to disinvite speakers. You know, we had Betsy DeVos at UB. We were worried, you know, but Kurt Schmoke, who's, who's liberal, I'm not, not branding him, but <laughs> Kurt's a, you know, a, a liberal <laughs> Democrat who was mayor of the city for three terms. Kurt said, we're going to listen to her. You know, she's the secretary of education, whether we like what she says or not, you know. And, and it went well. I mean, there was a protest, but it was a quiet protest. The kids that didn't want her there turned their backs, you know. That's all fine, you know. But we, you shouldn't be shutting them down. You shouldn't be disinviting them. Um, and, uh, and, and so we will work. Uh, now, the other thing that I hear all the time is, you know, all, all you people on campus are liberal, you know. I, you know, I've got one of the most conservative faculty in the country at Towson that was hired the same year I was. He's still there, Richard Vatz. You see him on TV sure. all the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm definitely a moderate. Uh, and, but like every profession, uh, people get attracted to it based on their genetic makeup. And, and teachers and social workers tend to be more liberal, you know. And so there is, you know, there was a bill, try, one of the states was trying to pass a bill that you have to, you know, for every Republican that you hire as a fact member, you have to hire a Democrat or vice versa, right? And go like, that's not going to work, you know. But I do agree with you. We, we, and the faculty should not be promulgating, you know, in a chemistry class, their political views, you know, uh, other than in an educational sense in terms of talking about policy and things of that sort. And we, we adhere to that also. So. Bob Corrette, everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>